at 3.25 p.m. on January 10th, 2009. U.S. Airway Flight 1549 took off from LaGuardia's airport in New York City. Just in about two minutes after takeoff, the cockpit of Airbus 320 goes dark, and loud, heavy noise are heard in the cockpit. It doesn't take too long before the pilot and the, and the co-pilot realize that the aircraft has been struck by a flock of geese. Both engines are on fire and completely shut down, disabled, while the aircraft was still below 3,000 feet. Captain Sollenberger immediately radioed a message to air, air traffic controller. He stated that he lost power and we are returning back to New York City. Air traffic controller immediately replied back, runway number 13 is, is prepared for you for your emergency landing. But Captain Sollenberger realized immediately and intuitively that his only option is to land on the Hudson. So he articulated and he said that we cannot make it back to the LaGuardia's airport and we are going to be in the Hudson River. He also considered that he may be able to land in Teddyboro Airport somewhere near New Jersey. And he, he said that to the air traffic controller and the runway number one was prepared for his emergency landing, but then he, he had made his decision and he said, I cannot make it to the airport. So my only option is to land in the Hudson River. And he did it. Captain Sollenberger landed the Airbus 320 with 155 people on board on the icy cold water of Hudson River somewhere between New Jersey and New York City. What do you learn from this incident? What does this heroic landing teach us? Well, my answer to you is expertise. What we learned from this instance is how the expertise of Captain Sollenberger saved lives. So, what I'm going to say for the rest of my speech is the story of what is expertise and who are experts. According to the cognitive psychology, expertise is that underlying mechanism of ex superior performance of individuals that we call them experts. And who are these experts? Experts are those people that have acquired considerable amount of experience and knowledge, specific knowledge and skill through years of practice and professional development. Research shows that these experts consistently demonstrate superior performance than people who are not expert or less experienced or less expert than them. In many domains, for example, in domains of sport, a baseball player, an expert baseball player, can, hit the, can swing the bat or hit the ball in a way that it's not even, those who are not experts cannot even get near that, the way that he can hit the ball, for example, in baseball. Or in music, an expert musician can play an in, a musical instrument in a way which is unimaginable to the rest of us. Or in surgery, an expert surgeon can perform a laparoscopic surgery in much better, less, with less error and faster than residents, for instance. So in these domains, when there is a culture of practice. Practice is a very important aspect of becoming an expert. And according to the psychologist Anders Ericsson, it takes up to 10 years or 10,000 hours of consistent, deliberate practice to reach that level of expertise. However, in many other domains, such as law enforcement, such as leadership, 
such as emergency response, hostage negotiation, where there is no that culture of practice, but there is one thing, decision making. That people have to make decisions quickly and intuitively in a matter of seconds under the pressure of time and stress. That intuitive decision making is what makes those people experts. Intuitive decision making was first introduced to us by Simon Herbert. Simon Herbert, back in 1970, he told us that experts, through dedicated effort, can recognize the nature of a situation and quickly identify likely solutions in a matter of seconds. In fact, the ideas of Simons has been well summarized in this often cited quotation that the situation has provided the cue, the cue has given expert access to the stored information, and the information in the memory of the experts give him likely solutions to that potential situation. So, expertise in these domains is nothing more and nothing less than recognition. Experts are able to recognize in a matter of seconds the new situation. And if recognition is that, is that important part of expertise, that means that we can use that recognition and put that into training to accelerate that process of expertise. In many, in many performance domains, one challenge for instructional designers or learning system designers is to design and develop training regimens that can somehow accelerate the expertise of individuals. Because according to the five-stage model of Dreyfus, that we have novice, advanced beginner, competency, proficiency, and then expertise, the systematic design of instruction, the traditional systematic design of instruction with roots in World War II training is excellent to bring, to move a large number of learners and performers up to that level of certified competency. But when it comes to moving learners from competency up to proficiency and eventually expertise, our theory and practice lacks. So, in my research, the large question of my research is that whether we can design and develop training systems that can accelerate that process of expertise and expert performance. I picked the domain of law enforcement because I believe the interaction between law enforcement officers and civilians it's a very sensitive type of reaction because there is any second that this situation can turn violent. And the ability of law enforcement officers to handle such situations with minimal use of force and appropriate proportional use of force is critical to all society, to officers, to civilians, and society at large. Because these incidents, the past experience has shown us that these incidents can quickly become flashpoints leading to protest or even riots across the nation. In high-stakes situations, law enforcement officers are required to make decisions fast and accurate. Typically, they receive training in defensive and control tactics and use of force methods. However, research shows that most of these trainings are focused on that psychomotor aspects of their training, which means the reaction but what comes before reaction? It comes decision making. They have to make a decision. How much use of force do they need in that specific situation? So if decision lacks, reaction is not, is not proportional. So I'm focusing on decision making aspect of law enforcement training with a focus on attack recognition. Defensive and control tactics have been deeply researched. However, that part, which is decision making, is missing. So my, my research can provide a strong foundation for practitioners to design and develop 
training regimens, training systems that can appropriately, with, with very cost effective, with very uh, low cost, can design and develop training systems, can, can, can train these officers. Because these officers do not have enough time to practice a decision making aspect of their defensive and control tactics. So I believe that this study, with a focus on decision making, can bring them up to speed. However, accelerating expertise by focusing on decision making and recognition, which is a very important component of that decision making. Recognition skills such as situational awareness, such as pattern recognition, these are very important components of decision making. If we can train that, we can accelerate the expertise. So I'm, I'm trying to, 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 to take that research has been done in the area of sports science and adopt them and bring them to the context of law enforcement and see how those, those things will work out. But I believe accelerating expertise is just the first step. The next step is to preserve and capture that expertise. What I mean is that, let's give you an, let's, let me give you an example. Imagine an employee, a senior employee, a leader, an officer, after years of practice, after years of service, is about to retire. How much institutional knowledge, experience, expertise is just about to simply walk out of the system? If we do not capture that knowledge and use it for posterity. One way to capture the expertise, one way to get that knowledge, that intuitive knowledge, that we call it intuitive in cognitive psychology, or tacit knowledge, the knowledge that they cannot express. So instructional designers and psychologists have to use specific methods such as cognitive task analysis to extract that knowledge. So that extracted knowledge in cognitive engineering, they call it elicited knowledge, one method to capture and preserve that is artificial intelligence. Specifically, expert systems. Expert systems are those, those computer programs that use artificial intelligence technology to simulate the behavior, the decision-making behavior and problem-solving behavior of human experts. With right information, these machines, these expert systems, can help leaders with decision making, engineers troubleshooting, and managers planning and scheduling, and many more other instances. There are many ways to leverage AI or artificial intelligence in training. An expert system is just one of them. For example, we can design adaptive training systems. We can design automated learning systems. We can design database learning systems, and many, other, many more other instances. For example, imagine adaptive learning systems. Right now, we have one training program and use that for hundreds, but sometimes thousands of people, specifically in corporations and organizations. Imagine you want to take that ethic training. There's one program for everybody, but imagine with artificial intelligence, we can have adaptive learning. We can have personalized learning systems that is just fitting this individual. What I'm saying is that we need to set the bar high. We need more experts. In today's modern era, that everything is changing so fast, from technology to lifestyle, everything is in change. We need different, we need new training and educational theories and practice. That's why I'm appealing to everyone who's involved in education, in training, from administrators to teachers to professors to instructional designers, learning system designers, policy makers, politicians, lawmakers, everyone. We need to design, we need to develop training approaches that not only accelerate expertise, but also capture that expertise 
for the next generation of leaders, decision makers, and problem solvers. This is not going to be an easy way. This is not going to be an easy road. But I do believe this is going to be the promising future of education and training industry. Thank you very much.